Welcome in to the Hot Read Podcast for Wednesday, April the 10th. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, Director of Published Content here at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network. You can follow me on social media at Easton Freeze. I am joined on time today by my lovely producer, JT. JT, my friend, how does it feel to be on time once again? We're back. I mean, just like me and the rest of the comments, we we are excited to be back. I I don't know if it was the if it was the total eclipse that maybe changed something within your within your circadian rhythm or whatnot, but uh, the vibes are high. Back into rhythm, um, yeah. The vibes are high here today, as Stony says. Always a good time to tap your toes in, in Club Hot Read before the show begins. Feels like yeah. I'm back on the dance floor at Red Rooster in 2011. I, I don't know the I don't know the reference, but <laughs> I, I mean, I guess that's a good thing. It's a sentence you don't need to know what, exactly what it means to understand yeah, the vibe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nostalgia. Like I, I get it. I don't know anything about the Red Rooster. And I didn't know Stonia in 2011, but like, I feel like I know exactly what he's talking about. Uh, D-Good in the comments saying at this point, he's expecting the show to start at 530. Wrong again, D-Good. Try again, buddy. Uh, yeah, I was super late to the last one for reasons, again, you don't care about. But today, I, this is my mea culpa, is I'm super on time, and we are super set to talk about the first position group in our positional draft series that I am all but certain the Titans will be walking away from this draft with at least one of these guys. Stoney's saying you guys are too young for the Red Rooster war. Apparently, is the Red Rooster even still around? Where was the Red Rooster? I have a lot of question, Red Rooster related questions. Uh, we'll have to get into those later on in the episode. Joey's saying I have some solid audio video lag. Thank you for the heads up on that. Um, JT, give some thoughts on linebackers while I try to fix that for a second. Yeah. Wow, guys, look, look at me now. Now it's just me. Isn't it great? Let's get these viewers up now that he's gone. Get him out of here. But yeah, this is going to be our first episode, I think, of the top 10 series where you're going to see a lot of different prospects on the board. Me and Easton were talking before the show and we kind of knew that there was a consensus top five or six here on the board. But after that, like we've talked about at the Senior Bowl and at the uh, Combine, it, there's a huge drop off that happens right after the top five or six guys. And that's what you'll see today when we're talking about some of these guys. You're going to notice that we're going to throw out a lot of different names at you because there are different guys in this class who we think have some upside but are not complete players in this draft class. So we have a lot of differing opinions compared to the last two because this is just a very different class here. Um, yeah, if, if you want me to keep going, as Stoney says, I will give you 10 minutes on the Notre Dame linebackers while you're gone because uh, they did they put a couple things on film that, that I really liked. And also, I just like J.D. Bertrand because he was giving us a lot of good Joe Alt stories at the Combine. So therefore, true. good right. stories equals probably a decent player. And I wanted to hope I, I wanted him to be on my top 10, but I kept watching the tape and I was like, ah, I don't know about that. So. Uh, maybe he'll be on there. Maybe, maybe he won't, but he did give us some good Joe Alt stories and Joe Alt is a big fishing guy. So, uh, you know, we, we learned that at the combine. So I agree wholeheartedly with everything. That now you're good. Said, look, look, even though I didn't, I didn't hear half of it, but I'm sure it was good. Is it, is this better? Is this you're good now? Fixed? Yep. Good. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for the heads up on that. I hate when we do an entire show and there's an issue like that. And nobody mentions anything. So thanks for that. Shout out, Joey. Okay. So yeah, like I was saying before I, I left, this is the first position we've gotten to. We, we've covered linebacker, or excuse me, we, we're getting to linebackers today. We have covered, um, what have we covered? Defensive linemen. We have covered uh, tight ends. They're so forgettable. I'm forgetting. Uh, those are the two positions we, we've gone through so far. Defensive linemen, not so forgettable. Tight ends, ah, kind of forgettable. But both those episodes are already up on the feed. So if you want to get up to speed on the top 10 guys in those two position groups. You can do that already. I, I think that, uh, you know, our overarching idea with this series is to try to get you as, as informed on as many guys in this class. You know, we got, we go through 11 different position groups, 10 guys, each in those position groups, at least. And since JT and I don't have the same top 10 lists, you know, it's, it's usually like 12 or 13 guys. So that's like, you know, 120, 130 guys in this draft class that by the end of this positional draft series, you will have a baseline knowledge of it and be equipped to go into this draft um, as a as an intelligent fan, which is what we're aiming to help make all of the listeners of the Hot Read podcast. So that is what we offer with this show. I think it is the best source in the Nashville media market, at least, for getting us up to speed on as many guys as possible in this class. And so today we cover a position that is the first in which, JT, I'm pretty certain the Titans will be coming away with at least one linebacker from this class. 
because of the comments we've heard from Rand Carthon this offseason so far. A couple of times he has mentioned this linebacker class, sometimes unprompted. We're looking at it. We, you know, we're we're thinking about it. And as we're doing our draft prep, we are seriously considering a linebacker in this group, which raises some eyebrows. Uh, it raises my eyebrows at least, JT, because like I think you were talking about while I was gone, the the cliff between you know the top four, five, six guys in this linebacker class and the riffraff. In my opinion, it gets really grim really quickly after you get past the. I'm sitting here looking like when you get past my fifth guy i'm not crazy about it and when you get past my seventh guy i'm super not crazy about it um so like the the you know my bot my linebacker 10 9 and 8 are guys that very much in the vein of our tight end episode where i'm giving you like one thing you know this is a a round seven dart throw for me and here's the one trait the one thing this guy can do that i'm banking on and that's kind of it that's that's the vibe i'm going to be going for with my list and it, it, you'll you'll definitely hear from us is when we give you the reference numbers of where they are on the consensus big board. Uh, for me personally, right. I think I have maybe one or two guys on this on this board here who may be in the consensus like 240, 250, and he mm. might be ahead of somebody who's maybe like 160 or something like that. It's very much just what you see on the tape and what you see as the prospect when going through this and what you like and what you think they can turn into. And I think that's where you get into like with this class, there's a lot of uncertainty, but Rand Carthen, to your credit and to his credit, uh, they think that they see a couple things in a couple of these guys that um, maybe they can turn them into those those rotational pieces or or full time starters, much like the stories of old when Rand Carthen was with the 49ers and taking guys um, like Elijah Mitchell in, in the late rounds and making them an every down starter and stuff like that. Maybe there are a couple people in this draft that they really do like. So that'll be interesting to see as we get closer to draft day and on day two and three. So let's dive into the top 10 linebackers of the 2024 draft. And just to clarify, if folks get a little bit confused, we had, we had some folks with our defensive lineman episode asking where, where's this guy? Where's that guy? And it's like, well, they're, they're classified by us and by many as an edge. So we're going to get to them in the edge episode today is just inside linebackers. So any of the outside linebacker edge guys, you're wondering where they're on our list. They're, they're coming in, in a future episode. I don't know exactly when we're going to get to edge. It'll be within the next week. So within the next couple of episodes, check that one out. And that's obviously another big position for the Titans. So the top 10 inside linebackers, JT, um, I've got two guys on my list that you don't have, and you've got two guys on your list that I don't have. Let's start with those four guys and kind of explain what we saw in them. And my number 10 linebacker in this class is Jalen Ford, linebacker out of Texas. He is an all right tester with all right size, slightly above average, pretty much across the board. Six, two and three eighths, 240 pounds above average size and height. He's an all right tester athletically, 47th percentile vert, 73rd percentile broad jump. And the one thing that I am sitting here telling you, you need to bank on Jalen Ford as a, again, a seventh round dart throw. I, where is this guy on the consensus board? Let's see. Just for the reference, like you were saying, JT, he comes in at. It's never good when you can't even find them. Uh, 141. Okay, 141 overall. So actually, the consensus board has him higher than I would draft him, but that's neither here nor there. The one thing that I'm banking on with Jalen Ford is his prototypical size and speed, or size and length, rather, his, his average testing, his ability to be a core special teamer with rotational um, break glass in case of emergency upside. Like, that's kind of the only, that's that's the best I can give you on him. Um, he's got good length. And so that, you know, that allows you to, there's some developmental traits there, some things you can work with as a coach, you know, it, from what I've read, he's a strong communicator. He's able to recognize, you know, recognize, uh, movement on the offensive side of the ball and, and, uh, identify alerts for his defensive teammates, pre-snap, um, good stopping power as a tackler, but there's, there's a lot left to be desired in terms of his recognition, uh, post-snap. You know, just the athleticism being average, you know, he he's, you know, downhill, a better player than he is side to side. So on the on the X axis, he leaves a lot to be desired. So he's just a guy that if you're looking for a, a high ish floor, low ish ceiling core special teamer in round seven, then I Jalen Ford's your guy for me. 
Yeah, I, I played around with having Jalen Ford on my list. There are a couple guys on this list that were once on there and then found their way out. I think both of us were talking about Tommy Eichenberg on this on this list, who is on, I think, the consensus top 150 or close to it. I also, think he's like consensus tight end or, or linebacker six or something. It's the, both did not he did not make our make our list so like like you said there's going to be a lot of different variants on our list i'm back or seven 134 overall peaking at 86 if somebody drafts him in the top 100 i'm going to mock that team incessantly our buddy stoney keely earlier today said the the heat check on tommy tommy eichenberg is that he's a caveman and yeah that's that's true (laughs) i I think i i asked for the heat check because i wanted to make sure i was crossing my t's and dotting my i's being like is there anything i'm missing with this guy and why he's up there and i really do think it comes back to that he played at osu with like i said on our d lineman episode with a thousand good top 100 draft picks in the next year's draft and i think that he may be a product of that more so um than oh i'm forgetting his name already uh michael hall Hall. jr um was potentially but with my number 10 here staying in the big 10 hey and by the way just can i can i say one thing on tommy eichenberg real quick sure you look at his pff numbers like trying to sell you on him as a top 10 linebacker yes he has a 52.7 coverage grade very i mean just abysmal in coverage if he has to turn uh to flip his hips and, and run downfield with somebody it's a it's an issue but the the consolation is that he's like the most average run defender ever so there's that He's very average at one thing and very bad at another, which makes him a top seven linebacker. Apparently, I, I he he is the canary in the coal mine for oh this class might kind of stink after the top couple guys, and um, I think that it does. My number ten guy here staying in the Big Ten, Curtis Jacobs out of Penn State. Uh, he comes in on the consensus board as number one sixty overall, and there were a couple things I found in his game that I really did like. Um, just from looking at his measurables itself, um, he's a good athlete. He, his 82 percentile 40 yard dash with a four, five, eight, one, uh, broad jump in the 85th percentile, not the biggest uh, size in the world coming in at six, one and two forty one. Um, but I think he's a good enough athlete that he could turn into a rotational piece given the right system. Um, he's not the best run defender in the past year. Uh, He was graded out per PFF as a 55.8 run defense grade overall in the 2023 season. If you look at the Michigan tape where you'd probably want to go first to see, well, what can you do against the best of the best in college? Right. Was not very, (laughs) did not look very good. However, there, yeah, um, he he is where he wins is in the pass rush. And I think that uh, he, he does have some decent moves in the pass rush game. He's also very versatile, played a lot of different positions and a lot of different snaps on, on the Penn State line, um, played over 100 snaps in the slot, uh, played 58 snaps on the D line, and then 283 in the box. So he had a little bit of versatility there last season. But because of the, because of the athletic traits there um, and his pass rushing ability, I think that he could turn into a guy uh, – kind of in the vein of definitely someone who I'm going to go back to a lot today because this this draft class kind of um, gives me uh, super vibes of Kenneth Murray. Like, I just keep oh, no. looking at all these players and I'm like, ah, Kenneth Murray, you know? Uh, a lot of guys who are really bad in coverage kind of get confused out there, but they can be a heat-seeking missile at times and rush the passer and get home. Um, and he was giving me a lot of those vibes today uh, because of his pass rushing ability. But, you know, coverage, not terrible, 64.9. He was okay in coverage, didn't really excite me in coverage. Um, going up against some some really nice pieces, you know, like a Cade Stover uh, over the last two years it was getting beat a lot in those games. But, yeah, I, I think that with with he is a project. I think that he is a day three, middle of the day three pick there. Um, but I think he could turn into a rotational piece. So my linebacker nine is just keeping them. I, I want to truck through these bottom guys because I don't, I don't feel they deserve more than like two minutes each. Uh, frankly, Michael Barrett out of Michigan is my, my ninth guy on the list. And on paper, he, he, he looks good. It's strong. He's got a very strong, I mean, elite pass rush grade according to PFF. And he's a well above average run defender. I think there is an element here to playing alongside junior Colson in that secondary he was never drawing the number one coverage assignment. He was never 
um, asked to be the alpha back there. Um, whether or not that's you know fair or unfair, like he'll be given the opportunity in the NFL to prove whether or not he was a junior Colson merchant or not. But uh, what he was asked to do, he did very, very well. He's not got the size to warrant him being much more than a sixth, seventh round pick, fifth percentile height, 26th percentile weight. He's just 5'11, 233. Um, he's, he's, he's got good length for that height. 78 inch wingspan is 62nd percentile. So he can make up for it a little, a little bit of his size with that length profile. But um, I, I think that he is a higher ceiling guy than uh, than a Jalen Ford. But um, I, I just I do wonder how much of being allowed to play alongside Junior Colson with such a small frame, never having to draw the number one assignment really impacts what he put on paper in college. Yeah, in my number nine guy here, kind of on the same line as you, as he had a running mate who is a is a better linebacker in this class. My number nine uh, linebacker is Nathaniel Watson out of Texas A&M on the consensus board. He is 194. Um, he is a running mate with Edron Cooper, who is one of the, you know, projected top three. Top I think you just four. said A&M. He, he's from Mississippi State. Oh, Similar Mississippi State. Red. Sorry. Yeah. Also my SEC. Bad. No, you're good. Uh, you know, same SEC school there, but still um, Nathaniel Watson. He's a guy that I think he has a good build. You know, he's not the most athletic, but his four six three forty does show on tape. Um, but he doesn't make a lot of mistakes in his game. Um, 5.4% miss tackle rate this past season. Um, you know, played a lot in the box. That's where he's going to play for most of his uh, most of his game here. Um, but the 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 build that he has is really nice and really promising to take a dart throw on. He is one of those guys that I mocked to the Titans in in my first mock draft 1.0 in in mm -hmm. the full seven round mock. I had we them. saw him at the Senior Bowl and he he was impressive. I thought uh, in that, he was in that one week. of the guys in round seven that I, I had them taking a dart throw on because of you know the size that he brings. You I mean 93 percentile wingspan, 69th percentile in height, six foot two and a quarter. He's got the traits to build into a good player. Um, you know, in in co in, um, in college, he was really productive as well. 16 coverage stops, which was tied for 43rd best in, in the nation. And then uh, 30 run stops, which was top 100 in the nation. Um, I think he's got the size and the build to become a good player at the next level. It just depends if he's given the time and which team gives him the right dart throw. All right, so the next eight guys on our list, we both have in our top 10. So we've got eight more guys to get to, which we're going to do in just one second. But first, if you're watching with us live on a Tuesday afternoon, we appreciate you being here. You know the deal. Help us out by making sure you're subscribed to Broadway Sports Media on YouTube. If you're not watching there already, what are you doing? Get over there. Go to YouTube, search Broadway Sports Media, and find this live stream on that channel. And while you're there, make sure you're subscribed. If you can hit like on this live episode, that helps us in the algorithm and all these things. Again, just two clicks of your mouse uh, could help us tremendously if you like and subscribe real quick. And uh, one last thing I got to ask, um, of course, be subscribed on wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, wherever else people get podcasts. I don't know. What other podcast apps are there? Um, I guess like Amazon, maybe um, Google play, I, Google I play. <laughs> sure. If you're a Google, I mean, do you, shout out to our seven Google play listeners, I suppose. Um, the other thing that I want to ask is I have a, a survey going on. It's like an annual survey of the Titans draft uh, round one scenarios where I, I basically have listed what I think is the all encompassing 11 things that could happen for the Titans with their first round pick. And I'm asking you all to rank them. I'm trying to get as large a sample size as possible because then I take all of the rankings. I categorize them. I um, rate them. And then we, we get a numerical representation of what the Titans masses would most to least prefer happen with the Titans first round pick. And that is already up. It's been up for about a day over on my Twitter account. So if you can go in, it's very, it's like one of the four most recent things on my feed. So if you can go and find that, there's a list there. They are numbered one to 11. And all you have to do is reply with a numerical listing of your, your not, not what you think is most likely, but your personal preference from best to worst case scenario. So an example response would be like one comma, four comma, seven comma, 11 comma, so on and so forth. One through 11. That's all I need from you. Short and sweet. I know it will take a second for you to think about, but 
unlike all the politicians that have lied to you in your life, your vote does matter here. And we are getting close to a 200 answer sample size and your vote can impact um, what the result is. And I, I, I think it's a really cool exercise. So help me out by going and doing that. Stoney, this is reminders for you. Please go and fill out your survey. I'm, I'm not going to do the final tally until like I think in and we're going to talk about it on Thursday. So you have until Thursday's episode. Please get it done today or tomorrow, and that would help me out big time. Okay, back to the linebackers, JT. Um, which guy? Let's 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 talk a little bit about Trevin Wallace out of Kentucky. He is my linebacker eight. He is your linebacker seven, and we're starting to wade into the territory of guys that actually get me going a little bit. Like there's they actually pique my interest. If I'm being a hundred percent honest, and with Wallace from a Physical stand, standpoint, very average size, 6'1", 237, uh, 45th percentile-ish height and weight, but very athletic, um, 84th percentile vert, 92nd percentile broad, 93rd percentile 40-yard dash. So he is a kind of a Kenneth Murray-style athlete back there. He's not quite the size, I believe, of Kenneth Murray. I think Kenneth's a little bit bigger, but um, an athletic linebacker who had some underwhelming production in college. Um, he just I, he, he's more of a, a raw ball of clay to be molded than a, a pre-molded plug and play guy. And that's why he's lower on my list, just because, uh, you know, in coverage, in run defense, um, he's got an all right missed tackle rate of 11.5 percent. But in general, he left a, a good deal to be desired on tape. But you saw the athleticism, you saw the traits, you saw what an NFL team, an NFL coach could theoretically work with. And that's why I think he's worth a. We're into like the fifth, sixth round territory, in my opinion, on the consensus board. He comes in at 130 overall. So that's a what, like a, a mid fourth round pick, I believe. Yeah. And with that athleticism, you find it, especially on tape, the tracking and chase speed shows up there, especially with that above average missed yes. tackle rate, being able to maybe miss the tackle and still track a guy down. Uh, like you said, the 93rd percentile 40 yard dash with that four five one forty. You, you can see the, the, the speed on, on, on tape there. But like you said, not a lot of production. And that is why I also wrote down, uh, I put in quotations, Kenneth Murray tendencies. And what I wrote about that is that he overreacts a lot to different concepts and he struggles to respond. That's where you can really see the flaws in his game. 58.6 coverage grade this year in 2023, according to PFF wasn't the best and most efficient in, in, in coverage this year. Um, but like you said, athleticism makes him a great prospect and a project at the next level. By the way, on mock draftables database, uh, Kenneth Murray is an 82.9% size and athletic profile match to a Trevin Wallace. So um, yeah, you, you could maybe frame not it as best, maybe hey, not the best fit for the Titans then. Well, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Not for the Titans. I agree a hundred percent. And, and where did, Kenneth Murray, he was like a, he was a first former first round pick, second round pick. Correct. First round. First pick. round. Okay. Yeah. So you could frame this as, hey, Kenneth Murray, you're getting a, you know, former first round. You're getting 82%. Profile you're getting 82% the, on, of a first on, round prospect on, on at, day three. At a fourth, a fourth of a round discount, you know? Don't ask about how that guy, after that guy's rookie contract, what his financial situation became. But yeah, that's, that's what you're getting. Um, okay. Let's go. Uh, let's see. Let's do uh, Marist. Mer uh, out of Notre Dame, he's my number. Okay, hang on. Another last name I've got to uh, pronounce or attempt to pronounce. Marist uh, Lufau Li Liafu. I I'm not 100% sure. Do you have a better idea? Yeah, uh, Lufau was closer. So okay. you can go with that one. Lufau. Let's go with Lufau. Marist <laughs> Lufau, which I'm probably wrong about. Linebacker out of Notre Dame. Notre Dame. He's my seventh overall linebacker. He is your sixth overall linebacker. You texted me earlier today, like, hey, this Marist kid, I like what I'm seeing. What did you see? Uh, the one thing I didn't like about him is that he needs to stop missing tackles. 18.9% <laughs> missed tackle rate ah, his, his last season. One um, in five. Not great. But because of that, he has excellent tracking and chase down speed. He was a guy that I saw flying across the field in all the tape that I was watching. Um, everywhere where the play was on the edge, he was there and he was able to get there. Um, and you can kind of see that uh, with his 4.64 four speed in the 40 yard dash. And especially even though that is only 67th percentile, his 10 yard split of 1.59 is 70th percentile. So um, that explosiveness you can kind of see in his game, um, really good measurables all across the board. Um, 95th percentile arm length, 75% um, hand size, 
80th percent wingspan. Um, this guy has the build to be a coverage linebacker in the truest form at the next level. And that's really what you saw in his game. Um, he was one of my favorites in this class uh, to be a true cover spe specialist and maybe even potentially that green dot rookie guy that Rand Carthen alluded to 84.1 uh, or coverage grade, according to PFF, especially in, in the games, you know, when you go, when you're, when he's going up against the biggest competition, like a Cade Stover in Ohio state, I was really um, surprised and pleased with his game there in, in the coverage abilities that he displayed, especially uh, maybe playing next to a couple other players um, who who were kind of missing uh, some of their assignments, the, the ability for uh, Lufau to to kind of make up some ground there and, and cover mm. for them was something that really stood out to me. Um, so when you start to talk about who were some of the linebackers in this class that could uh, be the best coverage linebackers, um, I think that he could be one of these guys um, on the consensus board, I believe he's almost top 100. I think he's right around there. Um, if not, he, is, he, he has fallen to 145, uh, 145, 72. Um, so he's uh, all around the board right now. I believe on PFF's draft board, he's around the 100. He's right spot. at number 100, I believe. Um, but yeah. I think when, like I said, coverage is his biggest thing. If the Titans were looking for a coverage guy in round four and some of their other guys were gone that may be better at coverage, I think that he would be a good uh, pick for them. Yeah, I like Marist a lot as well. His general profile is he is, you know, a powerful downhill linebacker who still excels in coverage. And on my draftable database, um, in terms of athletic size comparison, he, he best comps to the top three guys here, uh, roughly 90% the same physical profile as a Darius Leonard, Edger and Cooper, another rookie linebacker who we'll talk about on the episode a little bit later. And then Bobby Okereke, um, who are all, you know, two, two of the th one, one is expected to be a future um, starter in the NFL and two have been, or were starters in the NFL for a good long time. So, you know, being well above average in pretty much everything, but his weight where he's 30th percentile, just 239. at, at that, at that weight, he still is athletic enough and, big enough due to his height to bring the wood. Like he, he is an impressive downhill player when he, when he triggers. And um, that, that's what I saw on tape a lot that, you know, I, I was most fond of, Hey, this guy can get downhill and be a problem in the run game, be a problem in the blitzing game, as well as not be a liability in coverage. That's the mark of a linebacker. Who's versatile enough. I think to work in the NFL as an actual starter. Yeah. I, I think he's one of those guys that once you get into, he's going to go, I think early day three, if not find his way in, into the, the late part of day two. Um, and I think that's where you could start to see him go. Okay. Keeping it moving here. And this for, for my money is where we get into linebackers that I think are actual potential impact draft picks early, like in the next year or two, th these next six guys we're going to talk about are guys that I think you could add to your team and have reasonable hope that they're going to have an impact on your football team. Not to say that all the guys we've mentioned so far can't, but I think you're going to have to find the right situation, get a little bit lucky and, you know, hit on a, a lottery pick a little bit. These top six guys are a little bit different for me. And at number six on my big board, my linebacker six, your linebacker five is Cedric Gray out of University of North Carolina a guy that we've talked about on the show a little bit already because he was one of my picks, the Titans in my mock draft 1.0 the other week. Um, that should tell you, I like him in particular as a fit for the Titans due to the fact that while he's a little bit on the raw side, he does excel in coverage. He's got the prototypical profile um, from an athleticism standpoint to be a reliable coverage linebacker, something the Titans need opposite of, of a Kenneth Murray. Now, from a size standpoint, 6'1, 234, uh, below average in both of those regards, but a 70th percentile 10 yard split, 67th percentile 40, 68th percentile vert, 68th percentile broad jump, very consistent, very um, uh, above, well above average um, athlete in that way. But when you look at his his coverage ability, according to PFF, his coverage grade is 78, uh, an elite grade, below average missed tackle rate. Um, he's fine as a run defender. The, the size, the athleticism is a little bit limiting in, or so not the athleticism, just the really the size profile, I think is what's limiting most in that way. 
Um, but what I saw on tape from him is, is a consistent guy that can be re- relied upon in coverage, played a lot of coverage snaps over, you know, over a thousand coverage snaps in his three years at UNC. And that's the kind of thing the Titans are looking for. Yeah, I, I was going to say right there with you, <clears throat> production was what stood out to me, especially among, amongst some of these maybe late day two, early day three linebackers playing at a power five school and it being really productive was one of the things that stood out to me. Um, he was tied 14th in the nation in run stops with 41. Uh, he Great coverage ability, like you said, four forced incompletions on his own last season. So uh, when, when he's in coverage like that, it's not just playing a soft coverage. He's on uh, being very physical with, with the guys that he is cover coveraging. And, um, he's one of the few linebackers in this class. I would feel comfortable going up for, uh, against competition in the slot. And that's something mm-hmm. that you could really see in his game played 76 snaps in slot, which was, um, almost the, the most he had in his career at UNC. He played 80 of them in 2021, but, uh, did play 773 snaps in the box. So a consistent player across the board. I think the one thing that you can find in his game because of his size there, uh, he's not as effective in the running game, in, in the run defense game. And that's right. kind of a product of his size, not being mm-hmm. able to to get in there and be a force in a game record there. But like you said, the, the measurables make him a decent athlete and maybe the wor- maybe worth a look on a day three. Uh, I think currently on the consensus board, he's 93 so, you know, right, right in that that sweet spot. Yeah, so the, he, he including Cedric Gray, five of these last six guys, our top six guys, are all on the consensus board in the top 100. Uh, we The next guy we're talking about is Jordan McGee, a linebacker out of Temple. And he is the one guy that you and I both are much higher on than the consensus. Where does he come in on here? Two, 249 overall. I think the consensus board is really sleeping on a Jordan McGee. Um, here, here's the biggest reason why. When you look at his production, yes, he's playing at Temple. He's not playing, you know, he's playing Miami and Rutgers um, and Navy, but, he, you know, so he's not UAB, he, Tulsa. He's not necessarily playing the top competition, but against lesser competition in college, he put up some really, really fantastic um, just numbers in, on, in the stat sheet, right? Almost 80 uh, overall coverage grade, elite, 90 coverage or 90 pass rush grade, elite, um, 80 run defense grade, elite. Uh, where he lacks a little bit is the the you know the depth of depth of run tackle his his run tackling his his run defense kind of a similar profile to a Cedric Gray because from a build standpoint he is on the small side six one only two hundred and twenty eight pounds that's eleventh percentile weight so he could stand to bulk up a little bit but as an athlete man ten yard split eighty eighth percentile forty yard dash eighty eighth percentile vert sixty eighth percentile broad eighty fifth percentile. Really strong athlete, a guy that you trust to move side to side horizontally on the field and not let a guy get an edge on him. Catch a you know a skill player running a sweep or in, on a screen like th- this is a guy that can fly around back there. And when you watch on tape um, what he was able to do in college again against slightly lesser competition, he looked like an NFL caliber player out there because of his domination, in my opinion. Yeah. Athlete, uh, he's one of the best athletes in this linebacking class, and you can kind of see through his game through 2021 through 2022 to 2023, he continued to get better and better. And I think that's what you want to see from a pl- from a prospect from one of these types of schools. I think I think he's my linebacker seven or eight on my list, mostly just because of that. You know, I think mm-hmm. I, I'm kind of more in line with the consensus board that maybe playing at a, a school like Temple maybe gives him a little bit of a knock. But because of the athletic traits, I think he's worth the dart throw in any of those day three picks for the Titans in a fifth or a sixth round. Um, if he is there, I think he could be someone who could become really productive for for this team because of what he was able to do. It's kind of like a Quinion Mitchell situation, you know, where he's playing at what, what did you want him to do? The, you know, that's where he played, you know, it's you tough can only play to, who's on the schedule, right? Exactly. And it's tough to kind of grade someone like that, but because of what we know about the draft and what uh, a lot of these teams like with, with the athletic profiles of, of players, um, Jordan McGee fits that profile to a T. And I, 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 I want to make a point. Um, about how he would be a unique positive fit for the Titans in, in the way that you alluded to right there, JT. Um, he would be a guy they could add in the sixth or seventh round, I believe, that could be an impact player for them, maybe not immediately, but down the road. Um, and, and you know, he the, the reason I think he would fit, not just with what the Titans need from a personnel standpoint, but with the ideology that the Titans' new coaching staff, new defensive coordinator has laid out, um, 
you know, they want to be aggressive. They want to be downhill. They want to be, they want to be in, in the offense's face, being offensive in their defending, if that makes sense, not being reactive, um, but being proactive. And McGee fits that bill exactly, despite his, you know, concern size wise, the, the play demeanor is active, consistently active and aggressive, you know, he, he high football character on field intelligence in his scouting report. He's the kind of guy that's going to get after it and be a, a Denard Wilson type of guy if he were to join the Titans. And that's why I like him a lot for this team in their fit. Um, moving on to the top four guys here, uh, just to kind of make it clear, this is another tier break for me. Um, according to the consensus, this is definitely another tier break. These top four are the clear top four, in my opinion. And this is where you get into an interesting conversation with the Titans. Like they sure could use one of these guys, but they're going to have to use a day two pick on them. And the Titans only have one day two pick, which is 38 overall. And that is too rich for any of these four guys. In my opinion, I would, I would not be crazy about, I would be, I would like these guys on the Tennessee Titans, but not at the 38th overall pick. I don't like that value one bit. And so if they were to add one of these guys, I would imagine it comes with a trade back in the second. Um, so a later second round pick or a, a third round pick that they acquire in a trade. That's how they got to get that done. And JT, that's the eye of, eye of the needle that, Based on their rhetoric, rhetoric, they seem to be wanting to thread, but I just don't know if they're going to be able to. Yeah, it's going to be tough, right? As as it always is, you know, they don't want to give too much away. It'd be hard to say, hey, we're going to trade back and then, you know, kind of give that away. It's going to be a very lucrative process here in the next three to four weeks. And it's not going to come probably until that Friday when we're on day two, right? Like we're not going to know exactly how this is going to play out until then, but probably not. They, they really have been alluding to trying to maybe move back as that 38 could become a really, really nice position, especially if we kind of see the the, the smoke clear on a quarterback like Michael Penix Jr. or Bo Nix. I think 38 right there could be a very interesting possibility for a team wanting to look to move up to secure one of those. Kind of, They're kind of in the same spot where they actually traded up for Will Levis last year. A team could be looking to do the same this year mm -hmm. with them. So I think that that could be uh, something that they're looking for. And I think that's where you would start to maybe think that they could take one of these linebackers. And I think both of our number fours, we, we have the same number four here, I believe um, in right. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Trotter, who I think on the consensus board is the 83rd overall. Um, we can go ahead and talk about him. I think he personally right now for me is bar none. The, the linebacker that I would say has the best football IQ in coverage and understands the game the most, um, kind of the same argument I was giving to maybe a Cam Smith from South Carolina last year. One of the mm -hmm. smartest guys in the class for me. And he has in. to be at this size, right? Cause that's where he's, that's really where, lacking. that's what I also said as well in, in my note size is the biggest concern and the speed isn't really there. 10th percentile height, 11th percentile weight, um, 14th percentile wingspan, 25th percentile arm length, um, did not do the 40, but even then, uh, the three cone and 20 yard shuttles, both are sub 50 percentile, not the, the best athlete in this class, but no. where does he make up with that? He makes up with it in big in, brain, in, baby in, in the IQ and his production on the field. Uh, I mean, 82 coverage grade, um, 16.3% missed tackle rate. Um, you know, his average depth of run tackle is 2.2, which is pretty low for, for a linebacker given the, the PFF grading system. Um, but I do think he was productive in college, you know, um, he was 14 sacks during his time at Clemson. So, uh, he was in the right spot. He knows where to go on the field, you know, to, to make his name known and make his presence felt. Um, so, you know, that consistency over the last two years for Clemson has to be worth something, especially playing at a school like that. Um, so I think given all those things, he'd be worth a pick, a, a selection in round three, if the Titans were to trade back and find themselves in that position. Um, but like you said, yeah, right now at 38, I agree with that, to be honest with you. Interesting. Okay. And I'll explain why in a minute. I'll, I'll let you finish, but that's tough for me. Um, but like you said, I, I would not look at him in the second round. Yeah, I, I, Trotter is a nice player. He's going to be a useful player at the next level. Do not get me wrong. And, and the reason why he is not higher on my list is because of the way that he seemed. I, I think he's kind of maxed out already. I don't I don't see this guy as having a high ceiling at all. He's got a very high floor, and I think he's there. Um, I just don't know how much more he has to offer to a team. He, it's not an age thing. He's only 21 years old, but at six foot 230, 
below average athlete, he is leaning so heavily on that IQ and, you know, he's able to put himself with his technique and his understanding of the, the, the fit and the scheme in the best position to succeed at the next level. I'm not positive how much that is going to translate when he is, you know, playing up against guys that are just as smart as him and are twice the athlete that he is twice the size that he is in some cases, twice of both that he is that concerns me a little bit. Um, so I think it's going to, it's going to matter where he goes, the situation he's put in for a team to recognize his limitations and allow him to do what he does best, which is outsmart the opponent and be really fundamentally sound. So I think that he will be a useful player at the next level, but that ceiling is really low for me. And that's why I think he's my, my fourth linebacker. And, you know, if you spent nine, the 90th overall pick on late day three or late day two, late round three pick on him, I'd be fine with that. But be before that, I would, I would have a lot of questions to be honest with you. Yeah, I think, and that, that's where I think they would get him. You know, if they're moving back five spots to get the 90th overall pick, I think that's where you start to look at him potentially. And then with that fourth round pick, you can start to look at some of the cornerback positions and or wide receivers there and address it or vice versa. You can, you can do both because like I said, and like you alluded to there, I think more times than not, teams are going to look at that size and think that is a pretty glaring issue. Yep. All right. So that brings us to the top three linebackers in this class, a pretty unanimous top three. All three of these guys are inside the top 60 on the consensus draft board, and they are Peyton Wilson, linebacker out of North Carolina State, Edron Cooper, linebacker out of Texas A&M, and Junior Colson, linebacker out of Michigan. JT, they are our, both of our top three linebackers, but we have them in a pretty different order here. Let's start with Edge, Edron Cooper out of A&M. He is my linebacker three. He's your linebacker two. So you like him a hair more than I do. Um, I, let me just give, I'll give my two cents on him and, and you I'll allow you to respond to the allegations here. I, everything on paper from Edgerin, I, you, you have to be a fan of from production to size to athleticism. It's there. He's got the goods. He's a prototypical linebacker size. Um, and, uh, Actually, he, wow, he's not as heavy as I thought he was in my head. So I, I guess I got that mixed up. He's actually a little bit below average weight, but well above average in height. So, I, you know, maybe a hair smaller than the prototypical size, but well above average athlete, which is what I'm ultimately getting at here. This guy's freaky and he will fly around the yard. 93rd percentile, 40 yard dash, ran a 451, 88th percentile, 10 yard split. So he's got the quickness to go with it. Um, the 57th percentile vert and broad. So above average in both of those categories from a, from a Twitch standpoint, a very, very long athlete uh, because of his height, he allows him to be a 95th percentile arm length guy. So he he's a little bit on the slender size, but the athleticism and the, and the length are absolutely there. And the college production is there, right? He was an elite pass rusher an elite run defender and an elite coverage guy. According to PFF, all three of those grades off the charts, 58 tackles in his final year of college played pretty consistently as a run defender or a guy in coverage, not too often being sent on a blitz, but when he did, he was able to get home um, slightly above average missed tackle rate. Doesn't really concern me all that much. All, all of those things on paper, not concerning at all indicative of a top 50 overall pick on a linebacker that you'd want. And then I turn on the tape and I just, there's something about Edger and Cooper that gives me a little bit of the heebie jeebies. Like I just, there's something off about it. It doesn't impress me the way it's fine. It's not bad. It's fine, but he doesn't have the moments where I'm like, that's, that's a guy that I'm banking on as a top 50 pick. That's a guy that I think has wild upside. That's a guy that matches the, the athleticism that you see on paper for him. I don't, did you have a similar experience in watching him or maybe that was just me? I, that's a really interesting idea because I, I think you're looking at him maybe in a light that he isn't. I don't think he is that he doesn't have the superstar caliber upside, you know, but okay. I think that, well, uh, yeah, we're on I think page, I guess. that um, in in the I, but that's the, the maybe the expectations. I, I don't think I've ever I was ever asking him to be that in this linebacker class. Okay. Um, I think the coverage grades maybe that's also because he plays a little different style of coverage that texas a&m asked him to than maybe you looked at in a couple of these other different linebackers he wasn't um playing deep down the field in his coverage and i think that's a big clarification when you look at a guy between like Lou Fowl, like Marius Lou Fowl from Notre Dame, who was playing all over the field versus an Edron cooper who stuck to his assignments um and i think that with with 
that he he wasn't asked to play all up and down the field. However, I think that he has more um, of the technical ability in the intangibles here than most linebackers in this class uh, have for for just up and down the board. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I think Edron Cooper, it, his all around game makes him th- my number two on this board. Um, you know, he's a guy that I think also may suffer from the narrative of, he, well, this was his best season. And before that, what did he do before that? And versus what did he do just this year? I think he falls into that category in that conversation, but mm. just looking at it, um, objectively from, from this year in, in the ability to make that leap. I think that you're seeing what he can be at, at the next level. And uh, Stoney here chiming in saying it wasn't just me. He got it too. But to be fair, his astonishment was based on Daniel Jeremiah having him ranked in the 20s. So yeah, like I I think like Stoney would say, just like me, I, I see him as a top three guy in this class. I see him as a guy worthy of a day two pick. I just don't know if a top 50 pick is doing it for me on Edger and Cooper, but we'll see. Cause like, you know, like you're saying, like I, we all see here, He's got he's got the goods from an athletic profile. He's got the goods from a production s- standpoint in college. Um, I just the tape left a little bit to be desired for me. Uh, the next two guys, the top two guys here. Well, actually, my number one guy is Junior Colson, linebacker out of Michigan. He's your number three guy. So I, let's st- I, let you know. Let's let the uh, the prosecutor go first. JT, you're not as high on him as I am, and then I'll I will be the defense of Junior Colson. What? What makes him the third linebacker in this class, in your opinion? You know, it's just not. You're a hater. Okay, good answer. So okay. here's okay. why he's not. Yep. All right, you know, keep going. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think no. He, he's his play recognition is strong. He he's up there with the top three as one of the best and smartest in coverage and understanding the game from that aspect. I think yes, also he, um, he brings a very interesting background for, from how he got into football and um, you know he he. Grew up in like Haiti, Nigeria, playing, right? Haiti, Haiti, okay, playing, yeah. uh, Haiti, uh, playing uh, soccer in, in football as well before he moved to the U.S. So I think so just coming, there's a lot of room to grow as well. I, I think so, but the, but does he have to? Right, because he came into the into the NCAA and came to Michigan and was a productive starter from from the get go. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there are a couple things that. He was um, he was fine his first season, but the the past two very strong, very strong, very strong seasons for him. I think what we're getting at here is that you know when you look at the numbers, I think he he is one of the best, if not the best, coverage linebacker in this class. However, Agreed. I think going through the 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 off season process and up to the draft, we don't have a lot of those um, agility testing numbers, and I think that's what's keeping him as that linebacker three. Now, if he, he test if he tested that, um, I think that there there may be. A, a true conversation where he is the consensus linebacker number one, but just because of that right now, um, he does not fit that bill. So I'm, I'm with you that the fact that he does not have some of those athletic testing numbers um, in this off season process, just a wee bit concerning. Um, it's just a little bit telling, right? That he doesn't think he's going to test well in that regard. But as Tony says here, junior Colson, the wiggle King, I like Colson a lot. He's my number one linebacker. Um, he does have prototypical size, 47th percentile weight, 69th percentile height. Nice. He's 6'2, 238. Um, he's a, a slightly above average wingspan, so he's got the length to boot. I like a lot of what this guy did on tape. He's the guy who, when I turned him on um and, and was watching what he did at Michigan the past two seasons, I was like, yep, that's the kind of guy I would want, not just on my team, but in particular on the Tennessee Titans. I, I believe he is the number one coverage linebacker in this class for my money, at least close with, with a Peyton Wilson. Cause I think Peyton Wilson's also fantastic in coverage, but man, I, I, I was fond of everything that junior Colson did for me uh, as a, as a coverage guy, not the greatest pass rusher in the world, but he's got two of the three legs of the stool. Very, very strong run defender. Very, very strong coverage grade, only a 4.7% missed tackle rate. So when he gets your, when he gets his meaty claws on you, he's taking you to the ground. I like what he has a lot. The background and the journey to this point. Well, I read a profile on him in preparation for this. Really interesting, like you said, growing up in, I don't know why I said Nigeria. I, I was I'm thinking of, I think Rook or Hor- Horo is Nigerian. So I think that's where my head was at. Um, but yeah, growing up in Haiti, playing soccer, moving to the, moving to uh, the, uh, the, the States and playing um, about to be in the NFL. I think that there is a, an argument to be made that like the not quite maxed out in his football IQ, not quite maxed out in 
becoming the best athlete that he can be on a football field. Very strong um, football IQ already, though, despite that. And I, I think he's, you know, can be a, a rotational floor starting upside guy pretty much immediately in the NFL. And that's why I think that he is my linebacker one. I like Junior Colson a lot. And that leaves us just one linebacker to go here, JT. Is it fair? He he's my linebacker two. He is your let's see where is he's your linebacker one. He's your yeah. linebacker one. I would be with you all the way. And my eyes are very man. I hate this time of year. The springs out. I don't know. Do you get spring allergies at all? It kills me. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, I'm just clawing my eyes out for the next three months. Um. Peyton Wilson, right? A little ADD moment there. He would be my linebacker one as well. If uh, you'd never told me anything about his medical history, if I had no knowledge whatsoever of this man's extensive injury list in college, I'd be like, yep, that's the dude with the bullet. I'm all in. So a big part of the reason why Junior Colson is one for me over a Peyton Wilson, I say a big part. It's really the only thing is I just don't know if this guy's going to be healthy in the NFL. But I, we can talk about him from a standpoint of, if he's healthy, because if he's healthy, man, this guy's a good player and he's your linebacker one. So give me the case for him. I was about to say, let me start off my case with saying, what if I told you that the injuries are behind him? <laughs> that, that I is, told you he but, got all the injuries out of the way before the NFL because he's exactly. playing the game. It's a long um, but that that is the, the biggest asterisk here, right? And, and as I looked at this, there are a lot of factors that gave into it, but I, I wanted to judge the players specifically on on um his Merit. play the, the, yep. the last year in the last two years of course in 2021 was the biggest year for his injury history only played two games but the last two years in 2022 and 2023 played 11 games and 12 games mm-hmm. respectively so he has been generally healthy for the last two years and because of that he has been really really productive i think the biggest thing uh for me between a uh, peyton wilson and um a junior colson if you look at the plays where, where, you know, that go directly into their passer rating allowed, you look at Peyton Wilson, who his passer rating allowed at 47.2. You look at a junior Colson, whose passer rating is a 90 point something. It's up there close to 90. This, Mm -hmm. I think he's tried and true the best coverage linebacker in, in this, in this, class for me with a bullet. And I'll go out and say that. I mean, first in the nation in coverage stops uh, with 26. When you look at some of his play against some of the top teams in his division last year in the ACC between Miami and North Carolina playing against Drake May um, against Louisville, who was, who was very, very good last year against the Clemson team still graded out super well. Um, I also think that he may be the fastest linebacker in this class. When I look at, oh, him I think you're right pick, about that part. Um, yeah, it's very easy to see him just absolutely chase some some a fella down in the. He's got in, some long levers, man. Six foot four, very tall for a linebacker. Two forty. Yeah, it, it's sometimes it's sometimes surprising when you're when you're watching the end of a play and you think it's over when you're watching his tape and then all of a sudden Peyton Wilson just shows right back up to make the play and I'm like, oh, okay, that's why I was still watching this rep. Um, but even then versatility in his game uh played 490 snaps in the box last year but then also played 173 on d-line 44 in the slot i think he has versatility in both in pass rush and in coverage i think his knowledge of the game also is uh is very very good which makes him my all-around number one linebacker and the reason why i was okay taking him with the 38th overall pick in my mock draft 1.0. I think that he is the guy. If you want a guy to like, let the, let where the green dot set it and forget it and know that you're probably going to have the most success from the get go. Mm -hmm. I think that you're looking at Peyton Wilson to be that guy. And if NFL teams and their doctors check him out and they believe that's what he can be, then I will defer to that. But uh, the injuries do concern me. If the injuries aren't, a thing like you said i think that he is he's easily the linebacker in this class that is the most scheme proof i think that he could be a starting linebacker in pretty much any defense because of what he has to offer from a i mean he's really a, tr- a true triple threat i think that he is a equally impressive run defender and coverage uh player to a junior colson for me the, the big difference is that he's also really really good pass rusher as well he can get after it because of he, he's got that crazy speed he can he can shoot a gap before uh the lineman can see him coming and close it up. He can get around the edge if needed. Um, So like all of that stuff is there, man. I just, yeah, 
it's really uh, he. I'm with it's you. Gamble. He's my it's number one gamble. guy with a bullet. Right. If the injuries weren't a thing, but man, and the injuries are a thing. And certainly on day two, if the Titans were to select him at 38, I would already start quaking in my boots because knowing that he has to deal with that with that history and, and the and Listen, the, what comes don't with that. Worry about it. They've rehauled it. everything. They've overhauled yeah. it. It's no, fine. Sure. They fixed it for sure. And, but still, it would give me pause. But it would. Yeah, I, I think he's the would be the perfect answer to their current green dot problem for this team. Um, he's why I, I, like I said, I mocked him, um, in my, in my, uh, in my first 1.0, I actually didn't even mock him at 38. It was in a trade back with, with the Pittsburgh right. Steelers. I think I had him around 52, mm -hmm. which I believe on the consensus board, I feel better about that right around sure. there. Right. I feel better I think about right that. around. I think he's above 52, that big 50, dog. He's 40. He's 40 overall on the consensus board. Really? So. Okay. So we moved up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So those are our top 10 linebackers. There you go. 12 linebackers. Cause we didn't have the exact same Tom Tepp list, 12 linebackers that, you know, you now know a lot more about than you did before. Hopefully you found that informative. And uh, I would, I'd reckon one of these guys is probably a future Tennessee Titan if I had to guess. So we'll probably be clipping uh, this episode in a couple of weeks and saying, Hey, here's your new guy. Here's what we had to say about it a couple of weeks ago on our episode. Um, that's going to be it from us today. We appreciate you being here live or listening in post. If you're listening in post, uh, join us live sometime. We're live on Sunday. Tuesday and Thursday afternoons around 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Those times are always announced on the day of recording over on our Twitter account. You can follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, and on TikTok at Hot Read Pod for all of the information on the show as well as some of the best clips and highlights and all of that good social media content stuff. So make sure you're following us there. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube, make sure you're subscribed on Broadway Sports Media and 440 Sports YouTube channels. Hit like on the video, all of those things you can help us out with. We appreciate the survey on my Twitter account. If you hadn't done it, go do it. It's very easy. It's it, it's it's an interesting exercise. I think you'll enjoy it. And it's very helpful to me. So go to at Easton Freeze, find that survey and fill that out for me in the next day or so. And I'd be you'd be my new best friend. I'll send you a cookie in the mail. Um, our positional series, JT, only going to continue to heat up as we get into some more and more exciting, more and more sexy positions. We've got linebacker, tight end, and defensive line down. I think tentatively, this is subject to change, but I think tentatively we are planning on Thursday to do the front half of the show, um, some topics related to the press conferences going on tomorrow, just a little bit of a news thing if folks haven't noticed. We've, we've got uh, the start of the Titans offseason program on Wednesday of this week. That's tomorrow, and at 12.15 Central Standard Time, we'll be hearing from the Titans head coach and both of the top coordinators uh, about all the things we're going to ask about them. So I'll be there and check out my social media and the hot read social media and all these things for everything we hear from those guys. We'll talk about that on Thursday of the first half of the show. And then we'll get into the top safeties in this class. And once we've got these first four position groups down, it's we're on the fast track, baby. It's we're getting, we're getting hot and heavy with wide receivers, with offensive tackles and interior offensive linemen with quarterbacks and running backs and uh, with the cornerbacks and edge players, the sexy premium positions, a lot of top, a lot, I mean, a lot of top end guys in this class. It's going to be the polar opposite of this guy's number 247 on the book. No, 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 my friend. It's going to be like all 10 of these guys are top 100 players and they all rock and let's differentiate between them. So those will be fun episodes. Make sure you're plugging and chugging along with us as we get closer and closer. Um, where are we? Are we three weeks out from the draft? Two weeks from tomorrow, I think the draft is? Uh, wow. It's coming Something like quick. That. Yeah, yeah, very quickly. So we'll, we'll be doing our live stream on Thursday and Friday, by the way. We'll, I guess we should start advertising that Probably. we'll be live streaming both of those. And that was a lot of fun last year. And a lot of you joined in with us and reacted with us. And we'd love to have you again. So check that out. All of the things until Thursday, this has been the hot read podcast for producer JTM, your host Easton freeze. And we'll talk to you then. <laughs>